Uh, Mr. Floyd, why have you uh, not permitted Negroes to bowl at your bowling alley here in Orangeburg? Because I have my own customers that patronize me 52 weeks a year. They support me year in and year out. I need no other business. Today, we are in Orangeburg, South Carolina to talk about the Orangeburg Massacre. Um, I did not know uh, about this massacre until recently, and, um, I, and I know I'm, I'm not the only one that did not um, get this history uh, lesson when <laughs> I was in school. Um, and this is something that I feel that needs to be known, just like many other stories that need to be known. But today we are gonna focus on the Orangeburg Massacre. Despite the desegregation laws that took place in 1963 here in South Carolina, um, I'm gonna fast forward you a little bit forward to early February, 1968. So. February 1968, a group of college students from South Carolina State University came to All-Star Triangle Bowling Alley uh, to participate uh, in their college festivities. Now, South Carolina State University is an HBCU here in Orangeburg, and um, they wanted to be a part of just like any other college student, just like any other kids, they are, they're kill children. They are recently uh, graduated from high school, so that would make them, what, maybe 18, 19 years old. They wanted to participate in the bowling alley um, that's here in Orangeburg, South Carolina, and this is the only bowling alley that they had here. Um, so they came over to, to bowl, and at that time, Harry Lloyd, which was the owner of All-Star Triangle Bowling Alley, refused to allow them to come in. Um, because he refused, the students, the African-American students, um, began a protesting because of the, what was happening, pretty much. So where we stand right now, it's approximately five blocks from South Carolina State University. So it started here and they turned around and they start heading back to the school in protest that they were not allowed to enter the establishment. Now, um, at the school, they when everybody got back at the school, I'm not 100% sure why the National Guard needed to be called, why the South Carolina Highway Patrol needed to be called and the South Carolina PD uh, needed to be called to contain these students, the FBI. It, it, was, it was just a huge, um, something that was pretty much blown out of proportion because these students wanted to rightfully participate in something that um, due to the laws that they were able to participate in. Uh, they headed back to the school. When they got to back to the school, they did create a bonfire. I'm not sure if it was cold that night, but um, the, a bonfire was made and they chanted and they sang and, and, you know, just trying to, I guess, at their age, figure out, you know, why is this still happening? And um, now it is alleged that something was thrown at one of the officers. And um, when this item was thrown, uh, I don't remember if it was eight or nine officers opened fire on school campus at these unarmed black children. Unarmed black children. So uh, when fire, when, when the, the shots rang out, you can only imagine the chaos and the hectic and the screaming and the running and the just, 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 just try to put yourself in that place for a moment. Um, these are children. So, unfortunately, three 
black students, gentlemen, young men lost their lives and 28 other students were injured. Now, one of those students or one of the young black men that was killed, he was not a student of the South Carolina State University. He was actually a high school student that um, it said it's either he go to he would go to the school to meet his mother his mother did work in housekeeping on campus whether it was to walk her home or it was to have lunch with her have a meal with her um, I'm not sure exactly um, what uh, he his business was there at the time but I do know his mother worked there and the other two um, black young men were students of the school now 28 other students were either shot, um, stampeded, trampled upon, um, just total chaos, total, total, total chaos because they wanted to come bowl. This is pretty much why this happened because they just wanted to bowl. Um, so right now we are in the parking lot, as you can see, as I was showing you, of all-star triangle bowling alley now i do have ellen that is going to come meet me here and ellen is also going to share um the story with us when she comes as to what actually took place uh february 1968 uh and we're also she's also going to let us inside so that we can you know check out the place and see what's actually left inside if there's anything um Left, I mean, from here, I can see that it is like some bowling pins on the counter. So I'm, I'm sure there's quite a bit of things that are left behind, but that'll give us a more of a, 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 of a visual. I got a little tongue tied there. Give us more of a visual as to what it would have looked like um, during that time. And once, uh oh, it's glass. And once we are done here, we are going to go meet Cecil. And Cecil is actually a photographer that was present on campus when the massacre happened. So he was able to capture, uh, you know, despite what was happening, he was able to capture a lot of the events on camera. And now when I say on camera, I don't mean film, I mean pictures. Um, it's told that he has a lot of shells and casings and things that were actually picked up from the the massacre site um, on that day and here this is this is and would be considered a landmark in Orangeburg South Carolina historic preservation fund an african-american civil rights grant program so from the looks of it they might be trying to um, preserve what is left so hopefully um, in the near future, we would be able to come back and see what they have done with this location and um, see even if they put it to good use at this point. Um, because what happened to these kids really was unfortunate um, just for wanting to be kids. The All-Star Triangle Bowling Alley. Ellen, right? Right. Ellen. Okay, so we have Ellen here, and Ellen is pretty much going to give us a, a quick little rundown as to what transpired February 1968, what led to the massacre. Ellen, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you for having this me. This is All-Star Bowling Lands, which was really important in the Orangeburg Massacre. It's on the register of uh, historic places, and the parking lot is also on that register. Okay, so um, as far as the students coming or the, the young men's coming to actually want to bowl. There weren't just none. They weren't. In fact, it's true that nobody has interviewed the women yet and we have that that we're going to do. Okay, so there was men and women or young men and young women. There were students and also of the women, one of the women, that I have spoken with has had seizures since she was beat up in this parking lot by the police. 
wow. hit on the head continuously. There was another young woman that I haven't spoken with yet who was pregnant and the baby died. Wow. So there is a lot more to the story, the story than people know that people have actually been told. And this is why I thought it was so important to go ahead and, and come and see if we can get as much of the information as possible. Um, because it's a very unfortunate event that took place. One thing that you will notice when you go inside is that it's intact. So it closed in 2007. It was built in 62. The massacre was in 68. And when you walk in, you feel like, you still feel like you're walking back in time. Wow. And we have a grant from National Park Service uh, of 500,000 is the first grant we got. We've applied for another one. And that's what we're using to preserve the building. Fantastic. We, it had carpeting in a lot of places and that's been removed. Okay. Okay, so let's put this on because I know it's probably not. Well, you might not want to do it if you record it. Oh yeah, it's uh, um, we have flashlights and a and a light. No, I meant you asked him. Oh, on if you're recording. Oh, but it's not. Well, okay. Well, I am gonna put it on anyway. I'm just gonna speak a little louder because you can it can smell some mold and stuff in there. There's definitely mold here. Um, I'll show you a few inches. Think that. We had them put tarps on the roof, um, but obviously they're not holding. Okay. So this would be here, uh, leagues forming. So I guess if they were, you know, leagues that came into play or um, uh, competitions, uh, you would sign up for your league and, and, and obviously. I'll point out to you what things are going to be in here. We will have a kitchen. Okay. And we will also have um, a gift shop. Okay, so. There's a door that goes further. So this whole thing will be both the kitchen and a gift shop. Okay. Oh, nice, once it gets up and going. These two counters right here will be restored and look like they did originally. And I see Including, there's still pardon? bowling balls left. Uh, we have bowling balls, we have pins. I don't want, just be careful because it's wet here. But if you look over there, you can see where the shoes are. Oh. That will be retained. Oh, look. Because yes. it's just so ancient. Obviously, we'll put new shoes. Right. So these are the original shoes back from the original. As far as I know. Wow. Obviously, all these ceilings will be removed. Right. So we got some DJ equipment here. Record player. We got shoes from size one all the way to size 14. And this will become a lunch counter. Okay, for the kitchen. The kitchen is behind it. Right, so this is where they'll come. They can come in here and get food. We'll have tables outside and all over here. And even down, there will be tables and couches for students to either eat or to eat. We'll have games. Okay, so we'll have the Southern Poverty Law Center has, which is a wall of tolerance. Okay. And what that is, is that there's a, a computer in front of it, and it says on it something like, I promise to work towards social justice. You type your name in, and your name goes on lights, and the sign, and it stays forever. 
Oh, wow. And nice. they keep revolving. Nice. Yeah, we do have bowling balls and we have pins. Boy, if these walls can talk. Well, actually, a lot of the people who are there then are talking. Oh, wow. And we are going to do, we're working now to begin uh, oral histories. Nice. Very nice. Uh, I don't know if you want to go down there because look, there's a lot of water here. I gotta go call the roofer. I could tell you the reason there's a delay on the roofing, mm -hmm. and they put that up is because when they went to start on the roof, they discovered that the roof is not made the way they would do roofs today, and they didn't know. Okay. And so it's a whole other process and a whole other materials. And we're waiting to get that settled. Okay. So just to have everything up to code. Up to code and also, uh, especially the outside of the building has to be historic. Okay. This is uh, uh, the Department of Interior puts out a set of guidelines and that's what we follow. Okay. Because this is going to be a national heritage site. Right. So we want it to be beautiful and functional and still historic. Right. That's a challenge. It is. It's going <laughs> to be a challenge, yes. Wow. So this is where it all started. Yeah, this was built in 1962. Original parking. Like you said, it feels like a time capsule in here. So it's like, you're really good. And so, we try to keep some of that, but still make it do. Right. And obviously use them. Down there, there's a room where we will have uh, community meetings, discussions. Okay, and we are back, and we are back with Mr. Cecil Williams. And Cecil Williams is who I was telling you earlier that was there during the events. And he is a photographer, and he has created this beautiful museum just to document all of the events that took place, not just the Orangeburg Massacre. Um, as I was looking around, there's quite a few very interesting memorabilia in here that, in my opinion, is a must-come-see. So... Mr. Williams, thank you for having me. And um, tell me a little bit about your experience while you were out in that battlefield with, with all this stuff just happening around you. Well, I want to thank you for being at the museum and taking an interest in this history because we should be all about our history. History really is, if you don't know your history, you really don't know your people. You don't know, it is so important. My personal opinion about history, it, it helps to shape values. And there's so much African-American history that is not known, it's not in the history books. So I appreciate your coming and what your program is doing, and we welcome you to Orangeburg. The Orangeburg Massacre in itself is a kind of an oddity in history. Uh, it is a period um, involving February the 8th, 1968, a time when most of America has integrated and allowed people of color to enjoy the benefits of living in a free society, but not in Orangeburg, South Carolina. At the time, no, uh, February 1968, if you wanted to bowl here in Orangeburg, 
you could not go to the local bowling lanes, and there was only one. You'd have to go 100 miles away to bowl. So students from Claflin, South Carolina State, and Wilkinson, and people in the town um, wanted to change that. Um, they uh, marched and protested. I'm involved from the standpoint that all of my life I have been a photographer. I started it uh, taking pictures for like Jet Magazine and became an official correspondent for them at 18. But my official role during the period we're speaking about here, 1968, about three years after the passage of the Civil Rights Acts, wherein we should have been allowed to go into a bowling lands because Congress has pa had passed laws giving us that right, but not in Orangeburg. But at the time, I was the yearbook photographer for South Carolina State and Claflin. And on the evening of February the 8th, I left the campus about nine o'clock. The students had built a bonfire. They were being contained on the campus by the South Carolina Highway Patrolman, National Guardsmen, city police, and state police. And they did not want the students to come off of the campus and into Orangeburg uh, because there had been protests for a few days and the students were being contained on the state college campus. About an hour after I left to go get a hamburger, police authorities, the highway patrolmen, unleashed gunfire mm -hmm. for about 10 seconds. They shot into a crowd of 150 students, killing three and injuring 28. That is called the Orangeburg Massacre. It's something that is a very brutal example of law enforcement out of control, just as it was then, just as it is to now. Seemingly, we have not left that kind of legacy when it comes down to treating people of color brutally and without um, uh, respect in this country. The Orangeburg Massacre, again, are just a, a, a very tragic event that took the lives and changed the lives of so many, and students who do not have any weapons to defend themselves. Right, there were children pretty much. They're yeah. just recently graduating high school and want to experience the college life and living and having fun just as every child and, and young adult should. And um, you said uh, for about 10 seconds, just fire bullets just rang out over the campus. So I can only imagine the chaos and running and screaming and, and just everything that was happening at that moment. Um, I know, I'm not sure as to how many officers it was. Um, was it about seven, between seven um, or nine? The uh, chief who commanded the law enforcement um, at the time was the director of SLED, that's the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. But it was actually the South Carolina Highway Patrolman. At about nine o'clock that night, uh, he commanded the highway patrolmen, 22 who were in the area, to load their weapons, weapons in which this is an exact replica, to load these weapons with the ammunition. But only nine obeyed. So you might say that there was some humanity among the others who did not follow his direction. But they loaded their weapons with double arch shotgun shells. That's a type of ammunition that's used to kill big game. Gorilla or uh, moose or yeah, large buffalo. Game, yes. Um, and they fired unmercifully upon them for about 10 seconds, killing three and injuring. Uh, such a, a waste. And again, it was without being provoked to do something. We, as students, they, we, they didn't have any weapons. Right. And uh, it was just that it, it was almost as if that point in time they grew tired of being there and keeping the students uh, on the campus. And they decided to just end it all, and they w went up on the campus and started killing students. The next morning, about seven o'clock, I drove my car on the campus, and it looked like a battlefield on the grounds where it actually took place. I began to reach down and pick up uh, some of the remaining uh, debris that had been left, including some of the shotgun shells. Um, among them, I picked up about a dozen shells, which are depicted 
on this colorized version of the picture that also appeared in Newsweek and Time magazine. A few days later, the Federal Bureau of Investigation confiscated these shells from me. But one of the things we're doing in our museum here in Orangeburg is we are preserving this history. As tragic as it might be, it's still part of our history, a history that we don't want to repeat itself. But through history, we learn lessons. We learn lessons from good things that happen. We learn lessons from bad things. The remainder of the shells are right here. These are the real shells that came out of the highway patrolman weapons that killed the students. So we're the only place that has this kind of, um, of um, uh, artifacts that point to that time in history when these students sacrificed their lives. They put their lives and bodies up to demand that we have freedom, justice, and equality in such a simple thing as boiling in a boiling lanyards. It's, it seems to be small, but it was a big thing that as an American citizen, where we, as African Americans, were called upon to defend our country and participate in the democratic process, that we were de denied the, the right to go into a bowling lane and bowl um, a leisurely activity, something I did not do, but so many people um, like to bowl. And if we wanted to do in those days, we would have to leave our town and go someplace else to a bowl. So again, it was a time in history to challenge those kinds of um, people and incidents. Yes, it was isolated. Most of the rest of Orangeburg had opened its doors, restaurants, uh, motels. You could go into, um, uh, say, a go travel on a bus and travel sit where you want to and those kind of things. But here was the bowling lanes that the city of Orangeburg allowed to exist because they were licensed by the city to run its bowling lanes. Yet they were violating the law. Right. Uh, under the mid-1960 legislation by Congress under President Johnson, again, these were laws that were passed that govern and change those things. And it was illegal for that establishment to deny students to bowl in that bowling lane. So they were uh, again, acting illegally when they shot them. Nine highway patrolmen were called in and um, again charged with the killing. In 30 minutes, in a trial in Florence, South Carolina, several months after the incident happened, each one of them was found innocent. Mm -hmm. So no one was ever charged. The state of South Carolina really has never even properly uh, asked for forgiveness or really admitted and, and or Their fully faults. investigated or even paid the families for burying their youth or for the wounded to pay the doctor's bills and the hospital bills. So again, this happened again 55 years ago, but it's relevant today that if we can spend billions of dollars to send to Ukraine, hmm. just think about the fact that there are similar situations here in the United States that we have allowed to go on and on that have not been really brought to fruition in a way that we look back and compensate or recognize or again apologize. Right. You see, that even a simple apology has not come forth. South Carolina is a state where we were the first to fire the shots that started the Civil War. And if it is true, that one of the largest demonstrations in civil rights history took place in Charleston, South Carolina with an event called the Charleston Hospital Workers' Strike. This is about one year after the death of Martin Luther King in 1969. The civil rights movement, you might say, began, the Civil War began in Charleston and the civil rights movement ended in Charleston. Mm -hmm. You see, right. this, is, this is something that is, that is a revolving Again, circle. Yes, a cycle. A cycle, that, exactly. That, um, um, this um, is a time in America, here we are in the uh, 22nd century, still battling and trying to overcome racism to make this a society that is colorblind and to um, stop this nonsense about keeping people back or dividing people um, and just learn to live 
together and really become a community of mankind and work on the more important problems that exist. This is, is, is something that affects our youth, African-American youth. Most of the husbands, or possibly young ladies, are in jail. We spend more to keep people in prison. The, this country, as good as it can be, and as great as democracy is, we haven't learned yet to really find the root cause of what causes poverty and the cycle of poverty to keep people. African Americans suffer with not having any generational wealth. So that makes our youth try to cut corners to try to gain a piece of the pie, to participate in the democratic process. But they, they, they come from families who also have very meager and very minimal amount of things. And we're in a world where they're... I am sorry, my camera died. But as you were saying, Mr. Williams, you were talking about Delano? Delano Milton, Delino, I'm sorry. Yes, was a high school student. Also a football player, by the way. I had photographed him because he was on the football team at uh, Wilkinson High School, a segregated school at the time. Um, but again, I also did the yearbooks for high schools like Wilkinson as well. So it just turned out that I had photographed the three youth who were killed. But of course, there were 28 others who were injured, who admitted they were injured. Initially, uh, many did not come forth with saying they had been injured that night because law enforcement tried to uh, paint a insight to riot kind of uh, fixation to uh, what the students were doing on the night. And uh, indeed, they were not inciting to write. In fact, the highway patrolmen and law enforcement were invading the campus right. of our HBCU. So it, all, it was all completely, um, again, the opposite. But again, this is um, the legacy from which um, we come from, from which to build where we're going to go from here. If we don't learn this and learn the lessons from it, both black and white, then something is going to be uh, missing in the interpretation and there will be new obstacles, new challenges we face. And if we don't learn from our history, we're going to repeat the same things again, Absolutely. just as we have with um, the George Floyd case, for example. Law enforcement, again, uh, overreacting, uh, all the other uh, situations where um, law enforcement has uh, really exceeded their authority. Their authority. Uh, it was happening then, and it's still happening today. So if we don't learn from that, then uh, it's going to be very liable to repeat itself again yes. and over and over. Yes. Okay, so let's see what else you have. Here are the weapons used by the highway patrolman. This is a, a double barrel. This is a, 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 a 12 gauge shotgun. This is a 38 revolver. Now the 38 revolver can be seen in this picture right here where the highway patrolman is placing it back into his holster. Here are the two young men, two of the three young men on the ground here. By the way, again to show you the brutality and the inhumanity that was present here at this particular time. They pulled the two bodies to where that manhole that you can see clearly on the picture over here. And when one was still moving, then this highway patrolman shot him even again. Oh. And then they took their bodies to the hospital and where, where they were in minutes later, you know, pronounced dead. Uh, this is a scene of students and adults in Orangeburg walking in front of the Bowling Lanes establishment, which you saw today which is a little bit off of Main Street, Orangeburg. This event involved February the 6th, two days before. This is the Dean of Students getting the attention of everyone here. As you see, these are highway patrolmen here that are at, this is the bowling lanes in the back. And as you clearly can see, it had a snack bar in it as well. When a glass was accidentally broken in the windows here, uh, we all started running. I had parked my car across the street on Main Street, but when that glass broke, I saw city policemen reach for their weapons and some reaching for their billy clubs, which they wore on their left side. 
So I started running too. I had my camera dangling around my neck. And even though my car was across the street, I started running back towards the campus. Just as we reached Russell Street, Main Street, and the sidewalk on Main Street, Orangeburg, a young lady who was also running tripped and fell. And I saw two Orangeburg City policemen take their clubs and just beat her. They beat her so much that one of the earrings tore through the flesh of her ear. She was also pregnant and lost her child. So these are some of the stories, again, this brutality that has been inflicted on our, uh, our race uh, for such a long time. And it's gotta stop. There's yes. no more room in this world no. for any more brutality. And if there is, it should be dealt with quickly, more quickly than just the regular kind of justice that we have in this country. And only then it can teach those law enforcement people who act outside of the law a lesson. If it takes a long time to go through the judicial system, it's not going to work. Right. It must be dealt with immediately. You have when to start making examples out of them. Yes, they need to be jailed, they need to be fined to pay for it, and uh, they, should be need, need, they should suffer from it to give examples for others. This is a no-no, something you should not do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Here's a, uh, another display here. Of, uh, these were the yearbook pictures I took of the students. Again, I was the yearbook photographer at the time. This was the front page of the newspaper the day after the massacre. And this is Cleve Sellers here. Uh, Cleve Sellers, again, a dynamic um, um, young man from Denmark, South Carolina, which is um, a little town around 20 miles from here. Um, he was the only one that was jailed in this particular incident. Uh, they had to reach very hard to find something to charge him with because see, he didn't, he wasn't, uh, he himself was shot in the shoulder and wounded. But uh, they charged him with, with something two days earlier in an incident and he spent four months in jail. Later he got out of jail and of course they did pardon him. He went from, you might say, the jailhouse to the presidency of Voorhees College wow. after he got his PhD degree. So this is him in his presidential garment. He, by the way, is the son of Bakari Sellers, who nightly, if you watch CNN, you can see him on the air. Right, yes, so, I have. Again, uh, we all um, uh, respect him as one of those great unsung heroes. And there were many other players, of course. Um, there was, um, again, all of the national leaders coming in to the, see this incident and put their brand of um, interpretation on it. One of the persons, in fact, was the well-known uh, Stokely Carmichael, again, who um, is seen in this picture along with John Stroman, who was involved in the mask as well. But um, here's a picture, a present-day picture of Cleve Sellers by the Orangeburg marker, which is on the site of where the incident occurred. Right. So this is the history we're saving here. Along with the bowling lanes that you saw today, uh, we feel that this museum, along with that bowling lanes, will be something to make Orangeburg more of a destination, a tourist destination where people will come off of the highway, coming to Orangeburg, to see these historical sites and what happened here that really have affected uh, racial change in the United States. It's something that's needed. It's an education that, um, that is almost a must that we, um, we offer, something we owe this responsibility to our youth to make sure that they, um, it ha they know about this history. If it's not in the history books, we've got to teach them orally that this did happen and, and, and demand that they appear yes. in the history books. Today in America, a lot of times we found that history is really not even being taught in the public schools. No. So that is a problem. But if we are to find one of the solutions that we can point to that says, this is a cause for what some of our youth are doing today, it could be that we're not endowing them with the history they need to learn from the mistakes of the past. So I feel that educators should take note of this and again, demand that history is taught in the public schools. Yes.
black history, yes. our history, our history should be taught in the schools. You're absolutely correct. This is a very, very interesting um, setup that you have here with all of the memorabilia and photographs. And this is just one room, guys. There are a few other rooms in here that is loaded with um, just artifacts, memorabilia, just what history is, what our history is. Um, but Mr. Williams? I'd like to call your attention to a, a few other things in this room. Absolutely, let's do it. One, for example, is this instrument here. It's called the Charleston Hospital Workers' Strike. Here is 1969, a time after the death of the Reverend Martin Luther King. And in Charleston, the women working in the hospitals in and around Charleston are only paid half the wages that the white workers are paid. So the people of Charleston, led by women though, this is Women's History Month, like Women's History Month, led by women, marched and demonstrated in the streets of Charleston for 105 days. And they changed that so they got equal pay. Drawn into that um, the marches and the demonstration that took place in Charleston, South Carolina, was Coretta Scott King, as you see here in this picture, along with the leader of the movement. Andrew Young, over here. Ralph Abernathy, in the middle of this picture here. And here they are marching in Charleston. Here is, well, um, my background is I am a photographer, um, but I was inspired to create this museum because South Carolina was the only one of the 16 southern states that did not have a civil rights museum. Every other state except South Carolina. So it's something I've been trying to do for 30 years. Four years ago, in 2019, before COVID, my wife, my sister and I took about $60,000. We had the audacity to think that we could start a civil rights museum with $60,000. Mm -hmm. But we did have a building, and we did have one of the largest collection of civil rights movement artifacts and photographs and documents. So we did it. Since then, we have drawn 11,000 visits to our museum with our own resources. And so this is where we are now. We are just beginning now to get and obtain grants that will help us to continue to tell this story. We started out again doing it ourselves because we could not get the federal or the state government which should have done this job of preserving history of a people who changed the United States Constitution. This is what we did. This is how important. We helped to tweak the 14th Amendment and the other amendments that govern how we as a nation treat people and humanity. Right. But we had to really reach into our own pocket to really make this happen. And we did. And yes. We don't regret it one bit. And there's a beginning to everything. And this is your beginning. And I pray and I hope this is why it's so important to educate our youth so we can keep this going. Because if once our, because he would be my, and my elder is what we would call um, in this type of um, environment, that if I'm not educated by my elder, we would get lost. Yes. and forget everything that you've worked so hard to pave the way for me and my husband and my children and the generations to come. So I do thank you for thank this. Thank you. Do we Very have time to show you one more? Um, Absolutely. Visit? I'd like to show you a picture that um, it, uh, it, it looks like apparently um, I'm defying uh, segregation, but actually I would like to maybe thought of it, think of it like I was, but in, in effect, I was really thirsty. But well, here's an image um, that I, um, again, became involved in at 18 years old. I was coming back from an assignment for Jet Magazine from in Walterboro, South Carolina, going back towards Orangeburg, my hometown. And um, I got thirsty. And um, to show you some of the uh, degrading signs and symbols of segregation, we could not even drink out of a water fountain if it had white on it, white only, or colored water fountains or what have you. I got thirsty that day, and coming back from Walterboro, South Carolina, I pulled my car into a service station, I got out, 
and my friend who accompanied me took this picture of me. And then he got out of the car and I took a picture of him. Again, I wasn't really trying to defy segregation, but it has become a well-known icon of our way of defying and resisting segregation and Jim Crow laws that affected people of color and what they can do um, and can't do as citizens of the United States. So I'm very happy that um, this picture has uh, been displayed and uh, on the internet and other places, all of social media, um, that it shows a time and a day when we weren't just going to stand still and accept everything that was pushed in out front of our faces. Right. We had to defy Jim Crow. Yes. And a lot of us did that. Yes. And if you missed that, this is Mr. Cecil Williams in this photograph having a drink of water, regardless of what it said, as we all should have been able to do during any point of time. And this right here, is this the... This is a replica. A of replica the water fountain. of the water fountain. Uh, uh, um, I don't know what happened to the original, but of course we only went at kind of make this display. Um, again, we set up how, set out to do the museum. So it's a replica. But well, we try to make it as authentic as possible, possible. And, yes. uh, in this color. It was originally another color, and this was even uh, chrome, and we made it white too. Well, I, yes. you, you fulfilled that visual. Yes. Absolutely did. Yes. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you it's for been my to have what you you've done. Thank you for your, I mean, putting the boots on the ground and, and getting it done and, and your part in, in our history. I really do appreciate that. Let me put a footnote on it that um, to anyone out there viewing this, um, this couple uh, were patient enough to wait here at my museum when I had a mishap in my schedule and I want to thank them for their determination and giving me the opportunity to meet them here so they can continue to tell this story just to still kick the can down the road and tell our history to make our history more a reality and affect lives today especially our young minds we have an obligation to help them to pull themselves up to make better in their lives they deserve it our youth deserve it and we've got to demand. Yes. Thank you very much. And I can say that it was more than just me showing your museum. I needed to get this fulfillment for myself. Thank so you. I was not leaving here until that was done. <laughs> and I have been fulfilled. And like I said, this is something that you must come see for yourself. I will take um, a few more photographs and include that in here so that you guys can see um, the additional things that are available, but everyone thank you so much Cecil, thank you so much as well. Thank you for joining me on this another history lesson for the books and um, Again, I hope you guys enjoy y'all already know I love y'all for life Peace